Welcome to this first video um, of the series of videos I'm going to do on mechanical ventilation. So this is the first one and the goal of this video is just to give a little bit of a kind of introduction of the goals of mechanical ventilation and some of the categories of ind indications that we might see for why people get put on mechanical ventilators. But let's get started. So um, as many of you may know, um, mechanical ventilation, although uh, often used in critical care and we see it as a, a very invasive treatment. It, it really isn't a treatment at all. Mechanical ventilation is what we call a supportive care. So let's just write that there. Supportive care. And what we mean by that is that it doesn't treat the underlying issue that caused the person to become mechanically ventilated. So let's, say, let's just put this. This sign here means does not. Does not treat underlying issue okay underlying issue so that's important just to just to kind of address right away is that while mechanical ventilation is very very important and uh, often is a life-saving treat uh, life-saving intervention I should say for, for people who are critically injured or critically ill um, it, it doesn't treat the underlying cause of what caused them to be mechanically ventilated and we'll kind of get to that as, as we get through some of the videos here um, so let's look at then what are the goals of mechanical ventilation? Why do we do this? If it doesn't treat people, then why are we doing it? So the goals of mechanical ventilation. Let's just write that here. So I think the first goal, and anyone who's been in, a, in an ICU or has any experience in mechanical ventilators may appreciate this goal. And that's really, so the goal number one, that's really just to normalize their arterial blood gas. Okay, so normalize ABG, and by that we, we look at a couple of things. So we want to normalize the, the acid base, acid base, we want to normalize the ventilation side of their ABG, ventilation, and we want to normalize their oxygenation. Okay, I'm going to do a whole series of videos later on looking at arterial blood gas interpretation and how we sort of classify all the disturbances that pertain to these categories here. But for now, let's just look at normalizing arterial blood gas. That's one of the major goals of mechanical ventilation. And the other major goal is we want to re remove or reduce the patient's work of breathing. So let's just put reduce work of breathing okay wb work of breathing so we want to unload the respiratory muscles so let's put that unload the respiratory muscles give them a break as it were muscles and we, we want to do that in as synchronized a manner as we can okay so we want to do that in a synchronized manner Synchro, I've spelled that wrong, haven't I? Let's put an H there, synchronized. So let's just quickly recap that. We wanna normalize their blood gas from the perspective of their acid base, the ventilation portion of the blood gas and the oxygenation portion. And we wanna unload those respiratory muscles. We wanna reduce that work of breathing and often take over entirely that work of breathing by letting the ventilator do the work rather than the patient. Okay. So what causes somebody to need to be ventilated? Well, let's look, look at some indications. And we're gonna do these quite broadly because there's, as you'll learn, there are, there are quite a number of them, number of reasons that can cause somebody to go on a ventilator. So I'm gonna try and sort of group them together and, and categorize them as best I can here. So indications. So first let's look at kind of respiratory failure like somebody obviously if they're not able to breathe for themselves then then we need a machine to breathe for them so what what types of failure do we have in terms of respiratory failure so there are two types um, the first type is type 1 respiratory failure which is what we call hypoxemic failure so hypoxemic failure this is also called type one failure. Type one. Um, and that really is uh, what we call sort of a difficulty in oxygenating. So if we can just sort of classify this as pertaining to their 
oxygenation status. Okay, so let's just give a couple of examples. Again, these examples are not going to be exhaustive. That there's a lot of things which can cause cause hypoxemic failure, but some of the big ones, things like congestive heart failure, uh, maybe things like a pulmonary embolism, pulmonary embolism, or really any kind of VQ VQ mismatch, right? VQ mismatch, um, and things like ARDS causes hypoxemic failure. So again, there's there's lots lots more of these which can cause a hypoxemic failure, and I'm sure you can think of them. Um, but that's one of the major categories. That's type one failure. Let's have a look at the next one, which I'm sure you can guess is type two failure. And type two failure is more to do with a hypercapnic failure. And hypercapnic. So that simply, uh, let's just put failure, hypercapnic failure. And we've said that this is type two failure. Type two respiratory failure. And that pertains to um, carbon dioxide, right? It contains the CO2. That's what capnic, hypercapnic, this means elevated carbon dioxide level. Um, so you have hypercapnic failure. And um, what are some of the things that can cause that? So hypercapnic failures we'll learn as we get into ventilation and the relationship between minute ventilation and carbon dioxide. It is, it's typically caused by underventilating for some reason. Okay, so where the level of alveolar ventilation doesn't meet the demands of the body, doesn't meet the metabolic production of CO2, as it were, from the body. So some things that can cause that are drugs, drug overdoses. Um, we have things like COPD can cause hypercapnic failure and neuromuscular disease. Let's type neuromuscular disease. So, so these are some of the things that can cause a hypercapnic failure, an accumulation of CO2 which leads to respiratory failure. And a, a neat way to remember these, well, at least the way, at least I remember them, is type 2 failure is pertains to CO2. So type 2 is CO2. Okay? I don't have a clever way to remember type 1, but type 2, CO2. And what else is there? Let's look at that's that should when you look at it from here it seems to cover m most of the bases right you either have a hypoxemic respiratory failure or you have a hypercapnic respiratory failure that there may not it doesn't it seems initially that there why else would someone be on a ventilator and some people go on ventilators purely because they've been intubated and so we look at that as just some sort of a, a sort of airway protection type of thing some people just get intubated because they need their airway protected okay airway protection Okay, so someone has been intubated purely for an airway protection um, reasons. Let's say they have, I don't know, airway swelling. So, and as a result of that airway swelling, they need to be ventilated. There isn't really anything wrong with their lungs per se. They've just been intubated to protect their airway. And as a result, they're gonna to need to go on a ventilator. Otherwise we have to stand there and manually ventilate them all day. Okay, so, so really there's, there's three major indications that I can think of anyway, I'm sure there's more. You have the type 1 failure, that oxygenation failure, the failure to clear CO2 is your hypercapnic failure, and just being on a ventilator because we need airway protection. So that's a couple of the indications and goals. In the next videos, we'll start to dive into this a little deeper and look at how we ventilate people.